Bad Mex, The Stinger, written by Sean of Sana.net, the greatest wiki there is. Read by Shrapnel. But these mechs have targeting computers. Cadet Sebastian griped in the solitude of his mech's cockpit, to nobody in particular. I joined the AFFS to become a mech warrior, not to be some glorified infantryman. Raising his stinger's right arm, he brought the rifle-like medium laser up to its cockpit and attempted to line the iron sights up with the target 200 meters down the shooting range. He fired and noted with dismay how the green beam had cut a dark scar in the sand dune roughly 10 meters from where the target stood. Cadet Private Sebastian. Sergeant Zhao shouted in Sebastian's ear through his neurohelmet's radio. Bring your cockpit to the laser, like where you would place the butt of a rifle. Then try again. Sebastian wondered how it was even remotely analogous when they were over a metre between him and the iron sights on his laser. Let alone whatever refraction might be caused by several centimetres of ferroglass. Still, he did as instructed and held down the trigger just as his eyes lined up with the laser's sights. The green beam nicked the edge of the target where it left a small orange flame. Congratulations, cadet, came Zhao's mocking tone. You hit the target. Barely. Sebastian was considering a pithy retort when all hell broke loose. An explosion from behind knocked him forward and cut his stinger's sensors. Static told him he'd also lost comms with the rest of his training battalion. Staggering, Sebastian looked around to see a crater in the middle of the parade grounds and trainers running for cover. In the distance, the yellow flare of a dropship bore the Dow in fist of the Capellan Confederation. It was a raid. The procedure in such an event was for the cadets and trainers to get into the nearest available mechs to meet the enemy head on. Unfortunately for Cadet Sebastian, without a functioning radio, he couldn't be informed of the enemy's location or the battalion's rally point. In the end, it didn't matter. A bright green locust bearing the Capellan crust came into view and began firing its machine guns into the battalion's administrative building. If he didn't engage, everyone inside would die. Raising his right arm medium laser to confront the marauding locust, Sebastian made another unfortunate discovery. His heads-up display didn't have a targeting pick. Worse, he didn't have azimuth range or any indication his sensors had even picked up the 20-ton mech standing in front of him. It was then he saw the raised indentations of the laser's iron sights. He hunched his stinger slightly so the cockpit lined up with the laser, then took careful aim at the locust. He breathed, then held down the trigger. The green beam cut through the locust's right leg at the knee, sending it toppling to the ground. Sebastian raised his mech's arm in triumph and then realised he was still in the middle of a war zone. He also realised if his targeting computer had been working, the active scanners likely would have alerted the Locust to his presence and prevented him from getting the first shot. Hmm. Maybe these low-tech exercises aren't so bad after all, he said to himself, before stalking off to find more Capellans to ambush. We should have some compassion for this dinger. As the second ever mass-produced reconnaissance mech, and the second most numerous mech after the Wasp, mechs were simply less threatening at the time of its introduction in 2479. But between that year and the year 3025, the number of stingers in active service dropped from 200,000 to a mere 5,000. Over 500 years of attrition would surely be murderous on most military systems, especially when those five centuries included such things as nuclear holocausts. And yet, over 97% of every stinger ever made is now so much scrap metal. The stingers that survived were mostly used as trainers and not frontline combatants. Many mech warriors began their careers in a stinger. The smart ones moved on to a different chassis. The dumb ones are dead. As with many iterative technical achievements, the story of the stinger begins with a lawsuit. Earthworks Incorporated spent 20 years fending off a lawsuit from General Mechanics, the maker of the Wasp, for copyright infringement. General Mechanics argued that the Stinger was mostly just a Wasp, 
that swapped its SRM-2 launcher for a pair of machine guns. Indeed, the two mechs shared the same mass and a very similar outward appearance. However, neither Earthworks nor General Mechanics wanted their full mech designs as part of the public record. This allowed Earthworks to enact a time-honoured corporate defence. Delay, delay, delay. After two decades, General Mechanics finally dropped the matter and the Stinger would go on to stand beside the Wasp as the backbone of the Inner Sphere's reconnaissance forces. Unfortunately for the Stinger, many battlefield commanders felt that the highly numerous mech was expendable and used it in roles it was never intended, leading to accelerated attrition. One DCMS commander, Taiai Mercer Ravanian, developed the Charge of the Horde tactic, which called for massed quantities of lighter mechs, usually stingers and wasps, to be sent against comparatively larger targets, expecting sheer numbers to carry the battle. Taiai Ravanian attempted this tactic on three separate occasions, and on all three attempts, lost the majority of his mechs. It wasn't until after his death, on his third and final attempt, that his protégé, a surviving Stinger pilot named Marge Sippers, evolved the tactic to include heavier and more powerful light mechs, like the Jenna. Proving that it was the Stinger's lack of firepower that prevented the strategy's success, by 3140, the mercenary unit, Ravenine's Redemption, proved that massed light mechs could be a credible threat, but the unit was comprised primarily of faster and more potent mechs than the Stinger. Although not a credible threat to most larger mechs, the Stinger's popularity as a cheap recon trainer has kept it in service with almost every nation's armed forces. Earthworks factories on Keystone and Callaway 6 continued to produce Stingers throughout the Succession Wars, where the model found its way across the Inner Sphere, even as far as the periphery. Commentary Metalworks would also produce the design under license, although its focus would shift to the Commando during the Succession Wars. Other manufacturers included Bergen Industries, Vandenberg Mechanized Industries, Detroit Consolidated, and Hell's Pont Industries. Variants would even be produced by the clans, where they mostly served in an instructional capacity. The original STG-3R produced in 2479 came with a GM120 rated engine, six Chilton 360 jump jets, a single Omicron 3000 medium laser, two LGN Limband machine guns, ten single heat sinks, and three tons of standard armour. It became infamous for an extremely cramped cockpit, where an average-sized mech wire required outside assistance to be removed from post-mission, and oversized mech warriors couldn't fit at all. The design matched the Wasp for speed at a running velocity of 91.6 kph, and a maximum jumping distance of 180 meters. One notable feature of the original design was the old-school iron sights that remained on the medium laser. It was argued by Earthworks that this forced trainees to develop their fine motor skills as they adjusted the mech's posture and stance to fire these guns without the benefit of a targeting computer. The usefulness of this feature is arguable, given that it was eventually dropped on later models. Earthworks produced only two other variants prior to the clan invasion. The STG-3G replaced the machine guns and ammunition with a second medium laser in the left arm, with everything else remaining the same. The STG-3GB, on the other hand, was introduced for the SLDF's Royal Division in 2720. This model was upgraded to a 150XL engine, offering a top speed of roughly 111 kph, an endosteel chassis, and double heat sinks. Its armament was exchanged for three medium lasers and a single small laser, although no additional armor meant that the pilot had to rely on the mech's speed and jump jets to avoid incoming fire. With the rediscovery of Star League technology in the Helm Memory Core, the STG-5M began production in the early 3050s. It kept the standard engine, but upgraded the chassis to endosteel and added an additional half-ton of armour. It also replaced the twin machine guns with a single flamer and an anti-missile system with a single ton of ammo. Earthworks continued to iterate on the Stinger after the Jihad with the STG-6M, which replaced the STG-5M's weapons 
with an ER medium laser, an ER flamer and a laser AMS. The most modern variant offered by Earthworks is the STG-6R, which features a 160 XL engine for a top speed of 120 kph and eight jump jets for a potential leap of 240 meters. Two heavy machine guns and an ER medium laser harken back to the original Stinger model. Although most numerous in the Free Worlds League, Earthworks licensed the design to many other manufacturers across the Innersphere. The Lyra and Commonwealth's Coventry Metalworks is perhaps the most notable, which began producing its own variants in 3067. The STG-6S uses a light fusion engine and mask for a potential running speed of 151 kph and a jumping distance of 210 meters. Two light machine guns and an ER medium laser provide a lighter armament than the original and a small cockpit makes it brutally cramped even by Stinger standards. The STG-7S listened to pilots' complaints and replaced the small cockpit with a full head ejection system. It also swaps the light engine for an XL, provides an endo steel chassis and eight improved jump jets allow it to jump as far as it can run. Curiously, it also possesses a single ER medium laser for defense and its left leg carries slightly more armor than its right. The Torian Concordat is now the second largest producer of Stingers with factories on New Vandenberg and McLeod's land producing the STG-5R and 6R since 3067. House Liao and the Magistry also produce stingers on Cyan and Detroit, and Bergen Industries has launched its own line of stingers with the G-Series, culminating in the STG-6G in the early 3100s. The clans are also stinger producers. The Stinger C was originally produced by Hell's Horses and has since become the main trainer of Clan Wolf. An all-clan spec weapons loadout is complemented by an endosteel chassis and an additional small pulse laser. And in 3085, the Stinger 2C became a symbol of the newly formed Raven Alliance as the nation's primary trainer and reconnaissance unit. The Stinger 2C maintained the original standard engine, speed and jump distance, but upgraded the chassis to endosteel and the armor to ferrofibrous. It also featured significant firepower in two improved heavy-medium lasers and a single AP Gauss rifle. It's the Stinger's proliferation and not its capabilities that have kept it alive over the centuries. Modern incarnations have improved the design, but it's telling that most nations have relegated the Stinger to training and garrison units. That said, the Stinger has found a niche that will likely ensure its survival for many centuries to come. Hello everyone, Shrapnel here. I hope you enjoyed this month's episode of Bad Mex, written by Sean Asana.net, the greatest wiki there is. What do we think to the Stinger? I think the Stinger is very slow for a recon mech, but I still like the little bastard. I can remember playing this in my second ever game of tabletop. I went up against a star of light clan mechs on a clan on clan Zellbringen before I even really understood what that was. So I went in as Clan Goliath Scorpion against the Blood Spirits. And needless to say, didn't know what I was doing. So I took a Daishi and a Warhawk and I made them my best pilots. And then I filled it in with two C units or SLDF units. And one of them was the SLDF Stinger, which got chased down by a Adder. But it did fairly well. I mean, it got a few pot shots in. It was only in like turn three or four that it finally got pinned when I couldn't jump away far enough. I think the Stinger is a reasonable recon mech early on in the game. Later on, it is just not quick enough. When you're only doing six nine and you've only got six jump, you're jumping all the time. You're never going to hit anything. And to be honest, it's not great for sighting up indirect fire. So yeah, it is a bit of a waste of points in my opinion. Later on, it looks like it's getting good. I haven't played it in later eras, I'm going to though, especially this one that's got the heavy medium lasers. They are fun. Anyway, I digress. I love the little thing. It'll always have a special place in my heart, maybe not in my lineup on the tabletop, unless it's an early game. What do you guys think to the Stinger? 
Wasted BV? Important resource? Tell me. I imagine it might be good in a campaign, relatively cheap to repair and easy to get hold of parts. I don't know what its quirks are. I should probably look that up sometime. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below and as ever, drop a like, leave a comment, go read Sana and remember, stay safe out there mech jocks. I've been Shrapnel, goodbye.